Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. There's a really sad and difficult rite of passage that almost everyone will go through. I'm talking about the loss of a parent. I think even if you have a good relationship with your parents, you'll be left with many complicated feelings. Part of the grieving process will include wishing you had asked them certain questions that you never got around to asking. Wishing you had shared with them more, more time, more affection, just more of yourself. Some of us have advanced warning that our parent is going to pass. We may be able to say a goodbye, to say that final, I love you. For others, it's unexpected, and coming to terms with not being able to say goodbye is added to the grieving process. My next guest got the unexpected news that her father had died from a heart attack when she was still a child. There were so many questions that documentary filmmaker Denise Smekal didn't get to ask her father. As an adult, she began the process of making a film about him and his work. Her father, Roger Smeckel, was a celebrated architect in Brazil and the designer behind the most famous building in Sao Paulo. This building, a 24-story tower, was known as the Skin of Glass, due to its walls being completely constructed of glass. For Denise, this building was, in many ways, a representation of her father. And she begins a film that explores both the history of the building and the loss of her relationship with her father. The story that follows takes her on a journey that reflects the troubles and trials of Brazil itself. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. There's something so evocative about the title of Denise Smickle's work in progress film, Skin of Glass. What would you think of if you just heard this title and didn't know anything about the film? Skin of Glass. Glass, it's brittle. It's also transparent. It's also reflective. Those are all things that can be seen as themes of this new film. Denise tells this story from the inside out. She invites us along on a very personal story of exploring the relationship with her deceased father. She also documents the history of the building he created known as the Skin of Glass. This building in Sao Paulo was celebrated as a symbol of hope when it was first designed in 1961. When Denise returns to it, she finds that it has been completely neglected and is currently occupied by squatters who would otherwise be houseless in Sao Paulo. As Denise follows the twists and turns in the fate of this building that her father designed, she reveals, as one of her subjects said, a mirror of Brazil. What to do when you have so much of your population unhoused and infrastructure and other basic needs in the cities have been neglected for so long. Skin of Glass is a powerful cautionary tale for Brazil, the U.S., and beyond. Hi, Denise. Thank you so much for being on this episode today. We're going to talk about your new film that you're working on. Before we do that, can you tell us what you do? Thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to talk to you about my film, Skin of Glass. I'm a documentary filmmaker, photographer, and I am from Brazil, and I have been living in the Bay Area for the last 20 years. And I'm working on Skin of Glass. Now we are um, moving to post-production. You let me see some of this film and it's amazing. There are obviously a lot of questions that I have, but can you first just give us this idea about Skin of Glass? What is this film that you're working on? The Skin of Glass is a story of this building, this um, very modern building, modernist building that my father designed, my late father designed in Brazil in 1961. And it was a building that had all this amazing technology that 
made it its first of its kind in Latin America. Mm-hmm. And it was a curtain wall design. So the whole class, you know, structure was separated from the structure of the building. So it was a very, you know, new technology for architecture at the time. And and he was inspired in some buildings that are, were already built in the late 50s in, in New York. And they had used the same technology and they were like design and also inspired by Miss Van der Ho, who was a Bauhaus director, the last Bauhaus director, I believe. Mm-hmm. And so the story started when I found out around 2015, 16, that the, this amazing building, beautiful, all glass, in the middle of downtown Sao Paulo, was occupied by homeless people. And... I start looking at photos in the internet. I start finding photos uh, from photographers who had been inside the building and had photographed the residents. And I was just like very intrigued and very, you know, shocked. And <laughs> I was feeling all kinds of weird things because also I lost my father when I was 14. So it kind of, you know, opened that old wound, you know, that I had about my my loss. And I felt like the building could bring me some answers or maybe even take me to this journey close to him, you know, again. And so I decided to go to Brazil and start filming. You know, I said, well, maybe I should just go and do it. (laughs) First, we thought about making a book, a book about my father's work. You know, he was very prolific. He died very young. He was only 48 years old, but he was very prolific. You know, after I started my research for the book and then the book became the film, I found out that he had made at least 250 projects. And from those, at least 100 or so were, were built. And it was pretty amazing, you know. He died when he was forty-eight, and and he 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 was very talented. So I just thought that maybe that building, which was his masterpiece, could take me closer to him. And I went to Brazil, and I spent one month uh, filming and trying to get inside the building. And for some reason, you know, the the people who were coordinating that. Uh, Occupation, you know, they are called occupation coordinators in Brazil. They didn't let me in. They said, Oh, you know, I don't think the residents want you to film there. And I was like, you know, we we met, we talked on the phone, and and I was only thinking that I would be in Brazil for a month. And then I ended up staying three months and trying, you know, every other week, every week to to get inside the building and talk to the coordinators and they they you know sometimes they would say yeah they'll give me some hope and then other times you just say oh you know i don't think they want to talk to you and it was very frustrating so i filmed as much as i could and i decided right before i left to do a lot of filming around the building you know from other buildings and even from across the street from the building. So I even got to see people in the windows. And and I just, you know, I was trying to to get as close as I could to the building. And and maybe it was a way to go from, you know, outside in instead of inside out experience. But I just, you know, we just felt we had to do that. And for some reason we did, thank God, because... You know, you wanted me to tell the whole story? (laughs) I was going to ask for no spoilers, but then I saw on your website that actually the huge dramatic thing that happens is there. So you can tell it. Yeah. If you, if you want to, because it's, it's very dramatic. I even did some drone filming and that was December and it was raining a lot in Brazil. It was summer, you know, summer storm. So we start filming one day and we couldn't finish, you know, it wasn't looking good. And I, I returned to California and I, I was in contact with the, the drone photographer and in February, he ended up doing this beautiful drone shots of the building. And we had to wait like a few months because of the weather when, you know, it was summer vacation, whatever. So I was insisting, yo, we should do it. We should do it. We should do it. So in February, he said, oh, it's a beautiful day. I'm going today. I said, oh, great. And in May 1st, 2018, 
I woke up to like a dozens of phone calls, missed phone calls and texts and texts and messages from Brazil. And the phone was ringing when I woke up, you know, it was an off, but I saw that my brother was calling me and saying, oh, it did not happen. There was a fire in the building and the building's totally gone. And I'm like, what? So I went online and I started seeing all these images from the building totally collapsed. Yeah. And I just... I just had to sit down and, and take in all that information and I was in so much shock. Yeah. And and I didn't know what had happened to anyone in the building if people had died or not at that time because it was like, you know, only a few hours of after the the fire. So and I think the first thought I had was like, oh my God, I lost my father again. Wow. Wow. It's such a painful story, the story of this film, and it's very multi-layered. There is the personal story between you and your father, and then there's the story of the building. The building has quite a story of its own, which you just told, of going from being this promising, modern piece of architecture to being occupied by the many, many unhoused people in Sao Paulo and then to burning and then collapsing. Oh, there's one other layer that I forgot about too. It's really almost gives this history of Brazil. Not almost, it does give a history of Brazil as well. When you first got the idea that you would make this film, did you anticipate all of these layers, or were you just thinking this is going to be a way to talk about my father? No, I think it was the up. No, it was, yeah, totally reversed. I think the first thing was like, oh, this building tells a very interesting story about our country and where we are at and how did we get here. And then I remember that I had drove with my mom um, many, many years ago. And we drove by the building. She said, oh, you know, this is the now the, the federal police building. And, you know, your father made this building. At that time, I think I was a, a teenager. So we're still living under dictatorship in Brazil. Yeah. You know, so we had a very long dictatorship. It was it last like 21 years. Right. So I look at uh, at the building. I was like, oh, that's too bad that the federal police is there. You know, I, you know, I felt a little uncomfortable with that. So then I remember it and I said, oh, my God, you know, the building reflects the story of Brazil, you know, mm. inside all their occupants or even when it was abandoned because it's so amazing that it, it was built during this beautiful moment of hope and optimism in Brazil. A few years later, we had a coup and the building was, you know, was still being finished. You know, it took a long time for the building to be finished because it was made with like imported glass and imported marble, you know, and was a, a lot of technology that, you know, was new to 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 the country at that time. So it, it took a long time to be built. And so it was it started to be built during this period of hope and optimism. And finished when we already having to deal with this dictatorship, this military dictatorship. So it was, was kind of interesting to see that even the owner of the building at the time, the man who commissioned the building to my father, he was a very rich man, one of the richest men in Brazil at the time. And he had a glass company. And I think that's why he wanted to make a, a building made by glass. But he didn't have the, the turquoise color glass. He only produced the clear glass. So then oh. they had to import the glass from Belgium, you know. And so it, it took a long time. And in 64, so like three years after they started building the, build, the building, we had the military coup. And then because this you know, this man was also, the owner of the building was also involved in selling, you know, materials for the construction of Brasilia, which started with, a you know, kind of left wing or more leftist president. Yeah. And after the coup, you know, he was gone and, you know, 
the dictatorship kind of impacted his business because the military stopped buying from him. You know, they boycotted him. So he lost a lot of money and then he lost the building. So the building ended up being a federal building, uh, a building that was owned by the federal government because he couldn't pay the taxes. So he went to a federal bank. And and after that, you know, there was all these different federal offices there, the Social Security, the federal police. But when the federal police left many years after the dictatorship, they stayed there a long time, maybe 20 years. They they just left the building pretty much abandoned and they didn't do much any maintenance during the time they were there so the building looked a little bad but you know it was still there and they left a lot of um, you know tables desks and typewriters <laughs> they left a lot of junk <laughs> and they moved out to they they were building a new you know headquarters for the federal police and they just moved to a new building and they left all this junk and it was abandoned for like over nine, 10 years. And that's when the homeless people through these movements that are happening a lot in Brazil since the 1990s, they occupied the building. So the building was occupied twice. So the first occupation was kind of short and the police was able to at the time to, you know, remove the people from the building. They had a repossession of the building. And then in 2015, it was a second occupation. And that was the occupation that was still around during the fire. Mm. I'm curious about your feelings when you started doing the research and when you went down there and you saw the state of um, your father's building and you saw it being occupied by people who were unhoused, what were your feelings around all of that? They must have been a little bit complicated. Yeah, the first moment I found out, I was in shock. And then I got even more in shock when I saw how it looked like, (laughs) because it looked really, you know, it's interesting look, but it was, you know, it's pretty destroyed and some windows are broken. There's a lot of graffiti, amazing graffiti, but it's still uh, the first moment was really shocking. And the first reaction I had was like, (gasps) what can I do to protect this building to get destroyed, get, you know, more, even more, you know, destroyed. And, and yeah, I had this feeling like I had to save the building, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know that you eventually did speak to some of the people who had lived there. Did your feelings change over time about what was happening with the building or how did that go for you? Yes, it was, was, was quite an emotional journey. And also there was some change of heart when I started getting to know the the movement, you know, the housing movement in Brazil, because I had to wait so long to get inside the building, which I never was able to, you know, on time. So I had some friends who introduced me to people from the housing movement. So as I started meeting these people and interviewing them, and they would say, oh, would you like to see another occupation? You want to come to my the occupation that we have, our our movement just occupied this building. You want to see, you know, how it looks like. They also helped me connect with the the coordinators of my my father's building because they knew them. You know, they all know each other, mm-hmm. and so when I start like going to other places and 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 meeting other people, and 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 when I saw how people are living and you know. And how they had no option is like either they had to live in an occupation, which is not a perfect time for them either, or they would be in the streets because they couldn't afford to pay rent. And I saw so many families. I saw the way they're living in other places that were so much more organized. They look so nice. You know, they have community rooms. They had laundry room. They had a Sometimes, you know, if they had occupied a hotel, for example, they would have like a a big, um, you know, community kitchen for the whole Mm. building, you know. So it was a completely different feeling than what I could see from outside my father's, the Pelle de Vidro, the skin of glass building, 
it felt so different. And over time, you know, I tried so many times. I, they wouldn't let me go film. They didn't let me film inside the building. And then I, I started realizing, you know, people have no option. And, you know, at least my father's building became a shelter for these people. So I started changing my the way I felt about that occupation and how things looked. And you know, I, there was a, a shift. I think it happened even before the fire, you know. I, I got to understand that. And and then I kind of dropped all my personal <laughs> controlling or or even possessive feelings about the building maybe is representing my father to me at this moment and I just wanna, you know, take care of it and make it look nice or or have some control. And I had no control and I was left outside. And that was a very familiar feeling I had when my father left the house, when he separated from my mom and he went to live with another woman. And we had a fight and it was a fight that I had with this woman's son. Then I couldn't go to his house because, you know, I refused as a teenager that was very jealous and hurt by the separation and every, and everything that happened afterwards. I couldn't say, no, I, I will apologize. And I was really hurt that my father took his side and I, and he was asking me to apologize. And I was like, no, I was feeling very pride. Like, no, I, I'm not going to do that. And then we had like a few months of not very nice connection, my father and I. We would see each other, but it wasn't the same. And then I couldn't go to his house. So when I couldn't enter the building, it was like, oh, my God, this feeling is so familiar, you know. So it brought a lot of emotions and a lot of, yeah, it was hard, you know. It was really hard. Yeah, I can imagine. So that is the extremely personal story that you're also telling. I mean, it sounds like the story of the building is also very personal, but you begin the film with a letter, I think it was the last letter that your father wrote to you before he died. And it feels like your voiceover in the film, which is so beautiful, is almost the letter that you would write back to him now. I'm so curious, you're closer to finishing this film than not. How are you feeling about that personal story between you and your father? Now, after going through this journey with the film and the building sort of becoming almost this metaphor for your relationship with him. Yeah, well, after, let's see, four years, I feel so much better. Yeah. <laughs> but in the beginning, it was really hard and it was really painful. It took a long time to f figure out how the film was reflecting also my relationship to my father you know, how the coordinators not letting me in made me feel very much the same <laughs> as I felt when I couldn't go to my father's uh, yeah. new home. And, you know, it, it was hard and, and it took a long time to understand, to go really deep. And I think, of course, I, I'm doing therapy. I think it's great because it, it is important to recognize and, and work with these feelings, you know, so you can heal. And it has been a very rich process. The film is really bringing this healing to, to my life. Making the film is helping bring the healing. So it's really nice. And I feel so much better about it. It's, it's, it's so different than the, when I first started. I remember the first interviews I had over the phone when I was, I was still here, you know, planning to go to Brazil. I was talking to a lot of people who knew my father, you know, and now, so one architect would tell me, oh, call this so-and-so. And I was talking to a lot of people and I would cry every time I would finish the conversation. You know, it's like, it would be so heavy. It would be so intense. It would be so emotional. And so everything was changing over time and getting even more maybe clear or, mm. or less painful. Yeah. yeah. Can you say the name of the building in Portuguese again? We call it Pele de Vidro. Pele de Vidro. So that means skin of glass. Yeah. So Pele de Vidro is how a lot of architects call that technology of okay. um, cur the curtain wall Technology, so it's a nickname for the curtain wall technology in in Portuguese, pele de vidro. In in the part of the film that I saw, 
There was a person that you interviewed who said that this Pele de Vidro, the skin of glass building, was like a mirror to Brazil. And I felt like you really showed that in your story, but I felt like it was a mirror also to the United States, maybe to the Bay Area in a lot of ways as well. And I'm so curious because a major theme of your film becomes about this unhoused movement and trying to find housing for people. And I was surprised to learn that it's in the Brazilian constitution that everyone has a right to housing. The fact that you live in the Bay Area and we have such a huge problem with housing here, what were you thinking or were you thinking about those two parallels as you made this film? After I started filming Skin of Glass, I saw some news about the four moms who occupied this house during the, I think the winter of 2019, I guess. They occupied a house in Oakland that was empty. And and I said, well, it's exactly what they're doing in Brazil. Because, you know, we see a lot of homeless people here and they're mostly in the streets. And I haven't seen anything like what the Brazilian occupation movement was doing here. So I didn't see anyone occupying empty buildings or abandoned buildings or houses. So when I saw those four moms occupying a house because they didn't want to live in the street with their babies and their, their kids, I thought, oh, it's exactly what's going on in Brazil, you know? And those moms were able to make a deal with the city and I think the governor and they were able to buy the house, right. which is amazing. Yeah. But you know, it's one situation. In Brazil, we, we have only downtown, Sao Paulo, over 70 buildings occupied by homeless wow. groups. So it's a lot, you know, and it's a whole building. It's not like a house. It's mainly, you know, there are some houses occupied, but they mainly occupy buildings because they can have more families living wow. in the same space. So, and then I heard during COVID that some homeless people in LA were also occupying 12 houses during COVID to, to leave. So I thought it was interesting. I was like, wow, is it like a critical mass or, or people know about these stories? Or it's like a, uh, an inspiration from the past when there were like squatting happening a lot, right. but it was mainly artists in the, in, the, in the U.S. Yeah, so there are a lot of parallels mm -hmm. and a lot of differences too, but also there is this big need in both places and all over the world to house people. And and I think what was stunning in Brazil, and that's how this movement got, got inspired, is because they saw that so many places were empty. You know, there are more places empty than people looking for houses in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about almost 400,000 families in Sao Paulo alone looking for housing. So it, it's just like half a million people looking for places to live. And they're like so many buildings that are still empty, you know, for different reasons. You know, sometimes it's like the family member died and they're fighting over the building and yeah. or because they can't pay taxes, you know, the property taxes. So they... The building's abandoned. And now, maybe five years ago, the, the city is working this property tax that's progressive. So if they don't pay the first year, it's one amount. Second year is like that amount times two. So it gets really, really expensive until they lose the, the building if they cannot afford to pay for. And then they would use they'd like to use those buildings for uh, low-income housing. So it's a new project that is not to, is, we haven't got to the fifth year yet, you know? I think this is the f year number four. So I think they still need one more year for some buildings to, to not pay their taxes so they can bring people to live right. there. Right. Did the election of Bolsonaro add another chapter to your film or are you just leaving it as is without digging in too deeply to that? Yeah, I don't know yet what we're going to do. We're, we have a rough cut and we are still missing some scenes at the end of the rough cut, which we'll be working on uh, in a few weeks. We're thinking that what happened after the fire of the building was already 
a big crackdown in the in the housing movement even before Bolsonaro, and it only got worse with Bolsonaro. But as soon as the the building fire happened, the city started going after all the housing leaders, the housing coordinators, you know, the, the occupation coordinators. And at the time, five of them were arrested and they stayed in prison for 100 days. And we did film one of them before and after when she's released. So there was this crackdown and they're blaming them for like having people living in conditions that they can be killed, you know, just comparing all the occupations in Sao Paulo with the occupation of the building. So I want to make super clear that, you know, from so many points of views and from my research and from all that happened, I can tell you that the occupation of the skin of glass building was totally unethical. And this the, the two coordinators who were managing that building, they were just collecting money from their fees. You know, people pay, pay a fee to live in an occupation, so they're just collecting fees and they're not doing any maintenance. They're not improving anything in the building and they're not concerned about safety. And when you look at other occupations, when you visit other occupations, you see that they have all kinds of safety measures. They are maintained, they are clean, and and they were not doing anything for the residents in that building. You know, they're just collecting money. And also, you know, to have an occupation, to be part of the movement, you have to register, you know, every resident in the um, with the, the city, you know, because they're kind of in a line to get a house because occupation is not is not meant to be the a definite home for these people, you know. It's just a home while they wait for their own home. So, and there's nothing that they're doing that shows that they had good intentions. And even people from other occupations and other occupation leaders from other movements, they, they didn't like them because they knew they're not doing the right thing and they're making them the other ones look bad. And that's exactly what happened when the fire happened because then the government saw all the occupation movement as a reflection of that one. Right. And that was really bad. So there was a crackdown. They were like recording phone, the, uh, phone conversations of the leaders and they were trying to find things to find reasons to persecute and prosecute them. Right. The leaders of the skin of glass building, they're they're gone. You know, they're not nobody knows where they are because actually the police is looking for them. Because they were the first ones to leave the building when the fire happened. Wow. And they gave no support to the residents who lived for three months in the streets, you know, near the building in an encampment. Wow. So they just left and nobody knew where they were. But you're saying that's really an anomaly. Most of the occupied buildings are much better run, but they're using this one, this one bad apple as an example and just as an excuse to crack down on everyone. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Didn't you say I'm very excited about this film? I think it's an incredibly important film and I can't wait for it to be finished. If people want to find out more about you or this film, where should they look? Thank you. I think it's going to be a very beautiful and rich story. Mm. And it's very beautiful how for some reason, it goes from the personal to the global and universal very organically. You know, it's yes. a very special story. I could never have written that story. <laughs> and if anyone would like to learn more about the film or sign up to our newsletter, they can go to skinofglassfilm.com. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Yeah, and thank you for watching The Rough Cut. I'm glad you watched. I think it gave you more information, right? To yeah, and you know, sometimes it's hard to watch a rough cut, but I was glued to the screen. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Thank you. 
remember to be in touch on my Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and also on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. I'm so grateful to Denise for joining me on the show today to talk about her upcoming film, Skin of Glass. I think this film is incredibly important, and I urge everyone to see it once it's out. If you'd like to learn more about this film and keep track of its progress, visit the website www.skinofglassfilm.com. That's www.skinofglassfilm.com. In this episode, you heard the song AUV by Maya Salove, and as always, you heard Yellow Light District, an Otto Waschenlage instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Gilanian. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please follow the podcast.